Welcome to the ORS Virtual Scientific Session, Spine Biomechanics, organized by Dr. Sarah Galbrand in the ORS Spine Section. I am pleased to introduce today's session organizer, Dr. Sarah Galbrand. Sarah received her PhD in Biomedical Engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 2014. She is currently a Career Development Awardee at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center and Research Faculty in Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pennsylvania. Her research interests include the structure function relationships of spinal tissues, advanced imaging techniques, and tissue engineering. She has been a member of the ORS Spine Section Membership Committee since 2015 and currently serves as the Spine Section Membership Co-Chair. At this time, I'm happy to present Dr. Sarah Galbrand. Thank you for that introduction, Sherry, uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending our first Spine Section Virtual Research Update Series on Spine Biomechanics. Uh, so we'll have two 20-minute talks today. The first will be given by Dr. Grace O'Connell and Dr. Eric Ledet, and the second by Dr. John Martin. Uh, so our first talk will be given by uh, Dr. Grace O'Connell and Dr. Eric Ledet. Grace O'Connell is the Don M. Cunningham, Cunningham Assistant Professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley. She is the co-director of the Berkeley Biomechanics Laboratory, and her research interests are in soft tissue mechanobiology and tissue engineering. Dr. O'Connell received her PhD in bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania in 2009, where her research focused on intervertebral disc biomechanics with age, degeneration, and injury. Her research group focuses on tissue and joint level, joint level intervertebral disc mechanobiology. Dr. Eric Ledet is a professor of biomedical engineering at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a research scientist at the Stratton VA Medical Center. Dr. Ledet's research focuses on better understanding the in vivo biomechanics of the lumbar and cervical spine using smart implants and on, the, on, and on the therapeutic effects of mechanical loading on spine tissue and on spine fusion. Dr. Ledet is a past Essels Prize winner and has been a member of the ORS since 1998. He received his BS in mechanical engineering from the University of Arizona and his MS and PhD degrees in biomedical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, thank you for that really nice introduction. Um, I'll, we'll be presenting some of the work that we've been looking at in terms of spine biomechanics and looking for consensus in the literature, in the scientific literature, as well as um, the current researchers conducting spine level biomechanical testing. This work was um, conducted with myself, Eric Ledet, and John Costi in, in Australia. It's currently uh, 2.30 or 3 a.m., so he wasn't really able to make it today, but Eric is here to also present some of the work in the paper. So to give a little bit of background of how we came together to create this um, consensus paper that's under review in the journal, of, uh, the JOR Spine Journal, um, in the ORS 2019 meeting, the spine section meeting, the three of us presented on biomechanics and part of that discussion focused on differences between groups and different studies and how decisions are made, um, whether there's scientific evidence to support making one decision over another. So after that meeting, the three of us continued to meet through Zoom and Skype to discuss um, the literature, and we reviewed the literature for bone disc bone motion segment testing, um, looking at how every decision could be made from sample selection, sample preparation, all the way up to how you actually conduct the test. So the test conditions that are used, whether you use cyclic testing, static loading, uh, what are your initial conditions and your boundary constraints. And so we reviewed the scientific literature from 1990 to 2019. Uh, to look to see if there's evidence to support decisions that are made um, in that whole process. And we reviewed a total of 341 papers. From that, we saw that there was um, relatively little consensus in the literature. So we decided to conduct a, a survey of researchers that are conducting this type of research currently. Um, so we created a questionnaire of about 40 questions and we sent it out through all the different spine sections that we could think of, uh, including our spine section, ISLs and NAS. We ended up with 83 responses. 57 of those responses were from scientists and engineers. So from then we 
created the paper such that we could show that the scientific literature and how that either matches or doesn't match with uh, the survey responses. So um, for today, the sections that we actually reviewed in the literature um, include sample selection preparation, pre-testing measures, initial conditions, testing environment, test conditions, um, cyclic testing and viscoelasticity. And today we thought that we would pre present a couple of items that really st stood out to us in each of these areas and end with some best practices. So Eric will talk about sample selection and sample preparation. Thanks, Grace. <clears throat> yeah, we reviewed a lot of different topics. There are a number of different parameters, as you all are aware, um, that can affect uh, mechanical properties or the uh, bias mechanical properties during uh, experimental testing. Um, and we'll present just a few of those today, and I encourage you guys to check out the paper when it's actually um, published. So specimen selection is a very important factor that can confound results. Um, in specimen selection, there are a number of different factors that can affect the mechanical properties including the extent of degeneration. And this is not just for the disc, but also for the ligaments, arthrosis of the facet joints, and of course bone quality, especially if a therapy that engages the bone is, um, is uh, being evaluated. Um, this is generally a very nonlinear relationship between degeneration and mechanical properties. For example, the disc during early stages of degeneration becomes less stiff and more compliant, but then with advanced degeneration actually becomes stiffer. Ligaments exhibit similar properties uh, to that as they become hyper hypertrophic and calcified with increasing degeneration. Um, age is also uh, another factor that significantly uh, can uh, confound uh, results. Um, as you can see on the right, difference between um, uh, specimens of various uh, ages. Um, and, uh, and of course, spinal level. Um, and there's uh, different studies that have shown, uh, for example, that upper lumbar levels have very different properties than lower lumbar uh, levels, and that uh, spinal level um, can affect mechanical properties. Sex is also a factor that can affect mechanical properties, although it's unclear yet whether this is just due inherently to size differences between males and females, or whether there's actually material property differences uh, between sexes. Um, importantly, degeneration in males uh, advances, advances more rapidly uh, by age, and so we get multiple confounding factors of age, sex, and, uh, and size. Next slide, Chris. So specimen preparation also uh, affects uh, mechanical properties. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of work that uh, has talked about uh, the effects of freezing and thawing. Generally, the, the literature is pretty consistent that freeze-thaw cycles at 20, minus 20 C or colder, up to four cycles has minimal effect, but also the way the tissues are wrapped and prepared for freezing is very important as well. Um, tissue removal and the actual preparation of the tissues for testing is very important. Any ligaments that are removed, facet joints that are removed, um, can affect the mechanical properties. And of course, an intact motion segment has very different properties than an isolated intervertebral disc. So comparing results from one paper to another, it's very important to look closely at the preparation. Um, a more subtle thing, a very technique dependent, is the potting of the, uh, of the tissues. Um, and meticulous potting technique is very important to make sure there's no relative motion. And there's actually an interesting study that shows that higher stiffness potting materials can have up to a 9% difference um, in the appearance stiffness of the tissues uh, when tested uh, mechanically. Um, so there's a lot of different factors in the sample preparation that are also um, important. Next slide. So we asked a number of different questions related to this, um, and I thought I would just put a couple of them in here. So one of the questions was, for in vitro cadaver spine specimens, the following information should be reported. And uh, you can see the, the different breakdown. Most people felt that donor age, um, grade of degeneration, and disc level um, was important. Um, sorry, there's one missing there, but donor weight and height, you can see fewer people actually thought that was important to uh, report, as well as bone mineral density. And interestingly, while the literature shows that there's different properties dependent on sex, less than, uh, fewer than 1% of all the respondents indicated that donor sex was a variable they thought was important to report. Next slide. Uh, likewise, um, for example, one of the questions was, do you treat each spinal level, L2, L3, L4, L5, as separate groups in your statistical analysis? 
and you can see that only about one third of respondents said yes, um, and some of them were, uh, you know, it depended on exactly the question that they were asking. So these are things where the literature suggests that these are very important factors, but, but um, current practices um, are a little bit uh, less clear. Grace, do you want to talk about pretesting measures? So when we're looking at preparing our specimens um, in, in terms of calculating mechanical properties in classic mechanics, we always use normalization parameters, so stress and strain, so that we can actually compare across specimens. And this is a significant challenge in this fine community. Um, because most of the methods that people use to measure these specimens before testing would be MRI, CT, or X-ray. Um, and these can be very costly if they're even available at a lot of researchers and home institutions. And, and the reason for that is the end calculation is either modulus, which is you know, stress divided by strain, or stiffness, which is a non-normalized parameter. The other inconsistency in the literature is whether or not the motion segment, the bone disc motion segment is used for imaging or the total uh, spine, intact spine uh, from the, the tissue bank versus cutting the disc open after testing and looking at the cross-sectional area there. Um, there's growing literature and support to show that as you go from the intact spine down to the motion segment, you, each step you lose uh, residual stresses that are being applied to the, the specimen, either from the surrounding ligaments or the musculature. And so that would change some of your parameters such as disc height and disc area. And height is of a particular interest in terms of the relative changes that we see, um, partly because of the fluid flow during diurnal loading. Uh, some of John Martin's work has shown that uh, the, the T2, the water hydration in the disc can change, and this actually can change both the disc height and the overall volume, you have a volume loss. And so this is important as we'll talk about preloading, what preloading you apply and when you apply that. And so if this is the term, the, the parameter that you're using to normalize to calculate modulus, when you calculate height will really dictate what the parameters are that you're measuring and how you can actually compare them across um, studies in the literature. So it, just as a reminder that uh, John, who will be talking next, also has some studies showing diurnal fluid flow and a possible change in volume. So whether we're replicating studies to represent uh, the disc condition in the morning versus later in the day. So when we asked uh, researchers, when you're preparing your specimens, do you measure disc height? Um, about half of them said sometimes and 40% said always. There was no real consensus in terms of whether measuring disc height was a consistent part of this um, in terms of measuring it before testing. Um, we think that's partly due to availability of the machines or equipment, as well as the cost of it. At least at my home institution, the MRI costs $600 an hour. So if you imagine trying to test the intact bone disc motion segment um, at $600 for each specimen or for a handful of specimens, the cost uh, jumps up very quickly. So when we asked uh, in the survey what tools and techniques are used to measure disc height. The most common one was non-invasive imaging of the bone disc bone motion segment at 40%, um, and another 30% or 27% uh, did non-invasive imaging of the intact spine. And there was a, a reasonable size, 14%, that used calipers or rulers, which is likely uh, measuring the outside of the disc itself. And so you can imagine that the method that you use, there will be large differences in the outcomes if you were to compare it between the two. Um, and another thing that uh, we I observed in the literature was um, how do you just define disc height? So people will measure just uh, maybe the center location of the disc, but we know the disc is a wedge-shaped object and that the disc height really does change uh, depending where you are, if you're in the anterior or the posterior section, uh, do you average across that? And that really does vary from study to study. 
The survey results that we see here, whether disk area or disk height is measured before testing, um, was very similar for disk area. So for example, the, about 50% would sometimes measure disk area prior to testing. And similar techniques were used to measure disk area. When we start to get into uh, the details of the testing, we see a larger disparity within the literature. Um, in particular, the concepts of preconditioning and preload. Um, so preconditioning, the intent of that is to eliminate cycle to cycle variations in hysteresis to help for a comparison within specimen testing and between specimen testing as well. And what we saw in the literature is a number of different ways that this is done, ranging from one cycle of preconditioning to very commonly three cycles of preconditioning and on up from there. I think uh, as many as 20 cycles of preconditioning for a range of motion testing um, with a lot of investigators describing um, a technique where they would do a single cycle of uh, testing, preconditioning testing, uh, collect some data, then do a second cycle and compare the second cycle to the first and keep going cycle by cycle, analyzing data in real time until the hysteresis was um, sufficiently eliminated. Likewise, a whole uh, range of different techniques for preload. The purpose of preload being axial load to simulate uh, body weight and axial forces that might be observed um, in vivo. Um, what is well documented is that the magnitude of the preload strongly influences the load deformation properties during range of motion testing, including the stiffness and limits of range of motion, neutral zone, and hysteresis, and it's a highly nonlinear response. Um, larger changes uh, in, uh, well, initially small changes in axial load can make big changes, um, uh, have large effect in these different um, properties. Not only is the magnitude effect the response, but also the means of application of the preload. And as you um, go back um, it, through the literature uh, over the last few decades, the, uh, the methods of applying the preload have evolved. Um, with the breakthrough uh, Pawarden's follower load um, generally being considered to be the highest fidelity to replicate uh, in vivo loading conditions. However, as anybody who's tried this knows, it can be very challenging to implement and oftentimes is not practical. Um, if uh, range of motion in multiple directions is going to be measured or if there are changes, um, for example, implants that might be put into the spine that affect the um, instantaneous axis of rotation. So they can be very challenging. One of the um, big questions we think why there's so much variability with preload is because it's really unknown exactly what physiologic loading is um, in vivo. We know that it depends on spinal level. It also depends on what activity is being simulated, sitting, laying, walking, lifting something um, heavy. Um, also, the application of a preload could be uh, based on intradiscal pressure, not just the amount of force that's applied, but actually standardizing the amount of pressure in the disc or stress in the disc by normalizing force by area. And a review of the literature shows everything from zero preload up to about 750 newtons for lumbar and zero up to about 250 newtons for cervical. Next slide, please. So when we uh, asked uh, respondents um, about uh, in vitro biomechanical testing and what preconditioning protocols they used, what you can see here is there's a lot of uh, variability in the number of cycles um, and, uh, and how the, the data are analyzed. And basically, as you look left to right um, in the chart, if you can't read it, it's increasing number of preconditioning cycles as you move from left uh, to right. So most everybody agrees that preconditioning is um, a necessary part of uh, the testing that we do, but not in how it's done or the number of cycles. Next slide. Um, likewise, when we look at the axial compressive preload, um, and asking how important is it, um, we can see that there's a disparity in the responses. A lot of people think that it's absolutely um, critical and, uh, and a number of others do not think that it's that critical. And this again reflects the literature where there seems to be a huge range. Next slide. Um, and finally, just looking at what is the appropriate magnitude of preload. Again, we can see that there's, there's uh, generally no consensus at all uh, looking at the ranges um, that are listed here, ranging from zero all the way up to greater than 500 newtons for the lumbar spine. And although we're not going to show cervical today, the results for cervical were similar.
So when we actually start testing, the testing environment um, in the literature we found to be very important, both the time that you were testing as well as the temperature uh, that the specimens are being tested at. Um, range of motion, neutral zones, stiffness, and hysteresis are all affected by temperature. And so this is important for bending and uh, axial rotation testing where range of motion and stiffness were lower at room temperature than body temperature. And much of the testing that's uh, conducted in the literature, recorded in the literature, is done at room temperature. Uh, we also I saw that range of motion increases with testing time under ambient conditions. So that could uh, affect things if uh, one test or experiment takes longer to even set up. Um, so hydration is an important part of this. and. It, um, then hydration needs also really depend on testing time, where if tests are less than 90 minutes, the hydration method doesn't seem to impact the overall uh, parameters that are measured. However, what we saw was that there was no universally accepted method for maintaining hydration during tested. Um, the three most common methods observed were spraying saline with gauze, uh, periodically spraying the specimen during testing, or testing the specimen in a bath. So when we looked at the survey response, uh, the majority of respondents uh, indicated that specimens should be kept moist, so that hydration is important. Uh, only 22% indicated that immersion in a bath, bath was most important. And again, this is more important for the longer duration testing, such as um, viscoelasticity testing. And for those that used a bath, 77% used a preload. So with respect to hydration solution, there, there was actually pretty good consensus in the use of saline for hydration, um, which was great. But saline in the literature is based off the salinity of blood, and the disc is an avascular tissue. And very recent work from Don Elliott's group suggests that saline may not be appropriate for maintaining tissue water content with respect to the fresh state. If we're trying to mimic um, the physiological conditions uh, entirely. So this may actually be something that changes over time as well, even though there is consensus in the literature of using saline. So with hydration, um, it, it's also very important for cyclic and testing and viscoelasticity as we're um, either running more now because we're in COVID time or we're sitting a lot longer because we're on endless Zoom meetings. So this is an increase in cycles or an increase in the duration, the creep loading that is being applied. And the decisions that are made in terms of setting up these protocols, um, in the literature we see fatigue using, being used a lot, but in mechanics, fatigue is a failure property and, and actually getting the disk to fail in the laboratory is quite challenging. And so what ends up being called fatigue in the literature is really extended cyclic loading. Um, and the loading rates vary quite significantly. Um, and this is the range shown that, that was observed in the literature. And we know that the disc is viscoelastic and so it has rate dependent effects. So if you're applying extended cyclic loading, um, at some point you do start to see creep accumulation and that's what's shown in the secondary um, region. And what we end up with is people reporting different locations different uh, mechanical properties based on where they decide to analyze the data, whether it's at 50 cycles, 1,000 cycles. And this all assumes the same load amplitude. So you can imagine that if a different load amplitude was being used, you have dots that are somewhere else on this curve, um, making it near impossible to actually compare across studies. Similarly, with creep testing, um, creep magnitude and creep time varies quite significantly in the literature from as short as five minutes to greater than 24 hours. Um, and to actually try to get equilibrium in vitro, you need very long testing times over eight hours, so over physiological loading um, times. So I know we're running a little short on time, but I'll I'll mention that, so uh, Eric had commented on the preload, what is the appropriate preload to apply? And we went through uh, the intradiscal pressures that were reported by Wilkie and matched that with a finite element model um, from 2016 to provide 
different applied loading uh, values that could be used to simulate for different um, activities in vivo. And so if we compare that to the loads, the creep loads that are in the literature, most papers either apply hyperphysiological loads of creep or uh, evaluate creep at levels that are very low. And then that's um, for recovery, uh, levels of recovery that are below the lying supine position. So in terms of the survey results for static loading, there was no consensus on loading time. Uh, there was a consensus that both dynamic and static properties are important to measure and, and to report. However, a few studies in the literature actually did evaluate both static and dynamic properties for the same specimens. And this also brings us back to hydration issues, uh, where 50% of respondents stated that the specimen should be rehydrated be between tests um, and either rehydrated for a specific amount of time or rehydrated until the disc height recovers. And there's data in the literature to support that full disc height recovery is quite difficult in vitro. So the final topic that we'll cover today and that we did in the paper was looking at some of the details of the test conditions and testing technique. Go ahead and click, Grace, if you would. And there are a lot of different parameters here, force control, displacement control, or some hybrid technique, testing unconstrained versus semi-constrained, coupled motion versus pure moments, what loading rates are appropriate, what preloads are appropriate, is this done as a single degree freedom, six degrees of freedom, what type of actuator is used, a steward platform type system. There's a lot of different things. Grace, go ahead and click. Thank you. A lot of different systems have been described. There's a lot of different um, um, ways that people achieve testing. A lot of claims with um, some of the systems that say pure moments, unconstrained. And actually, if one looks very closely at some of the systems, it's not always uh, necessarily the case that they are pure moments or unconstrained. So there's a lot of different techniques that have been described, a lot of different techniques that are used. Um, one of the reasons, yeah, go ahead, Grace. One of the reasons why this is so hard um, and why everybody does it so differently, it appears, is that generally in vivo moments um, are unknown. Um, and there's a range that's reported in the lumbar spine as well as the cervical spine. But uh, generally, this has been something that remains elusive for measuring in vivo. In vivo motions are measurable, um, but being able to re repeat that from a normal healthy volunteer or someone who might be recruited in a clinical study and then reproducing that in a cata cadaveric specimen, uh, there could be some disconnect there as well. So this remains a big challenge. The next slide, Grace. And this is uh, reflected in our survey um, as well. And again, the question here was what type of bending moment, maximum bending moment is being applied. You can see that there is a distribution, um, a range here uh, as well. Next one. Um, and best take techniques for applying bending moment and rotation, load control, position control, a hybrid combination or either. And again, there's pretty uh, a wide disparity in the results. Next slide. So based on all of this, we put together um, what we felt were best practices. Um, every study is very unique and absolute harmonization is not practical. And so in the paper, based on um, what we had reviewed in the literature, we decided to make some recommendations. Go ahead, Grace. And I'm not going to um, read all of these um, because of the interest in um, uh, the running chart on time here. But basically that a lot of these different factors need to be reported um, and if possible controlled um, so that uh, we can compare um, one, uh, one study to another and results from one study um, to another. And that uh, includes um, a lot of things that, that we have um, discussed. Um, one more slide. Whoop. Okay. Um, and, and with that, we will uh, finish up and uh, take any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you guys both for um, a really great talk. Um, we'll now take questions from attendees. Um, as a reminder, you can type your questions in the chat box um, and I'll read them out loud. Uh, so as everyone is thinking of their questions, I'll, I'll just start off. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you guys um, only reviewed um, human papers or testing of, of human motion segments. Is that correct? We, we focused on that. Um, there was uh, a lot of um, some of the, the parametric work has been done in uh, animal, uh, using animal specimens. Um, and some of that is very relevant to humans, but others we actually saw some disparities in the results from looking at, you know, let's say porcine specimens versus human specimens. 
And so most of the conclusions that we drew and what we summarized were based on work that had been done on human cadaveric segments. Gotcha. So do you think the results will be, the, your recommendations will be something that um, folks who are testing animal motion segments will be able to, to implement as well? I think a lot of it like specimen preparation is pretty universal. When you start thinking about things like, you know, what's an axial preload to apply or what's the appropriate moment, you know, 7.5 Newton meters may be the appropriate moment in a human spine. If you applied 7.5 to a rabbit spine or sheep or pig or something like that, you'd probably not get a good result from that. So some of it is very applicable regardless of species and others would be very species specific for sure. Definitely. Thanks. Um, so I, we have a question from Ian Stokes, uh, University of Vermont. Um, he says, it appears that FE models struggle to explain variability between specimens as in normalization. Notably, dimensions such as disk area and height, which would be expected to have predictable effects on stiffness, etc. cetera. Uh, question, should FEM development and testing together with specimen testing be a priority? I'm definitely in favor of experimentation with modeling together. I think um, more crosstalk between researchers that do modeling and experimentation will greatly help the, the field. I think there's definitely things that finite element analysis can tease out that would be very difficult to do experimentally. And there's things that can be done experimentally that would be very difficult to do in finite element. And so I see those as being multiple pieces of the same puzzle um, there's not always harmonization between results because of some of these different parameters that can't be controlled. But I think that we gain a lot of knowledge from two different approaches. Uh, so Mark Gomez says, in the Zerbel study you cited, why were the ROM and stiffness lower at room temperature versus than at body temperature? I would expect higher temperature to make things softer. Um, I don't know if I could comment on the details of why. I'd have to go back to that specific paper just kind of highlighting certain um, results that we saw in the literature today. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. John Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin is a senior postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Duke University. His research is broadly focused on determining the relationships between spine biomechanics and spine health. As a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, John used animal models to determine that disc biomechanics are altered with degeneration and can be restored through tissue engineering. As a postdoc, John is developing a suite of clinical imaging tools to evaluate soft tissue composition, structure, biomechanics, and physiology for in vivo metrics of spine health. Uh, John, thank you for joining us today. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Okay. All right, so thank you so much for this spine section to, uh, for the opportunity to present my research. Um, before I start, I just want to introduce myself a little bit in my research. All right, so as Sarah mentioned, I uh, started as a graduate student at Penn where I studied disc biomechanics and tissue engineering. And I moved to Duke for postdoctoral research where I've worked on projects related to musculoskeletal imaging and pathology. In general, my skill set includes spine biomechanics imaging and tissue regeneration. And so using these skills, my research broadly focuses on determining the relationships between biomechanics, biology, and spine health, and connecting these all through in vivo imaging. So here's an overview of what I'll present. First, I'll have a brief introduction to low back pain and disc disease. Then I'll talk about reasons why back pain is difficult to diagnose. First, because clinical imaging techniques can't be identified, by, um, can't identify underlying causes of pain. And second, because we don't completely understand the pathogenesis of spine disease, whether mechanical or biological factors are more important. Then the bulk of my talk will be on projects that I'm working on now that I plan to carry forward in my next position. These all relate uh, in vivo physical loading to spine biology and health. So low back pain was recently credited as the world's leading cause of dis disability with uh, severe socioeconomic consequences for the United States. And uh, but unfortunately, an underlying cause of back pain can't be identified in 90% of cases, uh, leading to the often issued diagnos diagnosis of nonspecific low back pain. Low back pain is typically linked to the lumbar spine and often the intervertebral discs of the lumbar spine. And that's because the discs are subject to an age-related degeneration process that's marked by compositional structural deterioration of the tissue, as well as altered biomechanics, inflammation, and, and neuropathy. And while these factors are often cited as links between degeneration and pain, on an individual patient basis, direct links are often difficult to determine. 
And uh, one reason why is related to clinical imaging. So MRI is a, one of the standard imaging tools available for diagnosing spine disease. And I want to draw on an example of some MRI images to prove a point about clinical imaging. So I have a short uh, imaging exercise for everyone. So uh, think about this situation. There, uh, here are two T2 MRI images of two individuals who are about 25 years old. On the left, you can see that this, uh, uh, this person has six bright white nuclei with healthy disc height, normal spinal curvature, and a, a patent spinal canal. And on the right, you can see that this person has reduced MRI signal and, and decreased height across uh, disc across the lumbar spine, uh, a number of discs bulging into the spinal canal, and irregularities in a number of the vertebral end plates. So uh, think to yourself now, um, which one of these, these uh, patients, these images, uh, represents a patient with uh, back pain? So, uh, I just want to uh, say thank you for participating, but if you guessed either patient one or patient two, I'm sorry, it was a trick question. Uh, neither of these people actually do uh, have back pain. And so another major driving force in problem in spine research is that clinical imaging can be misleading in diagnosing disease. And that's because all of these imaging findings have high prevalence in asymptomatic individuals. So let's say you had a 50-year-old patient come to you in clinic reporting back pain and had MRI findings of disc degeneration and bulging. Well, 88% of asymptomatic 50-year-olds have disc degeneration, 69% have bulging, and 14% have uh, spondylolisthesis. So these findings alone do not suggest that they are the underlying cause of pain. And then in addition to clinical imaging, another reason why we can't properly diagnose back pain is that we don't know precisely what causes spine disease. So take disc degeneration, for example. Well, there are two schools of thought. One theory is that biomechanics is responsible for degeneration. And um, a quote from Stokes and Iatridis suggests that abnormal loading conditions can produce tissue trauma and or adaptive changes that may result in disc degeneration. However, another theory is that biology is responsible for degeneration, where regardless of the initiating factor, disc degeneration is thought to be mediated by abnormal production of pro-inflammatory molecules by both MP and AF cells. You may even remember the epic 2019 RS debate between Don Elliott and Mac Risbud on just this topic. Well, the primary role of the, the spine in the body is mechanical. Think about how the spine is loaded in these scenarios. It functions in tension, compression, axial rotation, flexion, extension, and lateral bending. This results in a very demanding mechanical environment. However, in addition, uh, the disc is poorly vascularized. And if you look at the slide to the right, you can see that blood vessels don't penetrate into the disc interior. Thus, the microenvironment is nutrient deficient, hypoxic, and acidic, and can only support a small cell population that's incapable of intrinsic repair. So in reality, mechanics and biology are probably closely coupled in this degeneration. And this argument can be summed up as the following uh, quote from Adams and Roughly, who suggested that disc degeneration is an aberrant cell mediated response to progressive structural failure. So as a postdoc at Duke, I've developed a suite of imaging tools to evaluate the mechanics, biology, and the health of the spine to answer some of these big questions in the field. Can in vivo imaging be improved to properly diagnose back pain? And then how does mechanical loading impact the biology of the spine and long-term spine health? Um, so now I'll talk about uh, what I've been working on as a postdoc towards these goals. And the first example is connecting uh, spine mechanics and degeneration in the context of scoliosis. So, one to 4% of adolescents develop abnormal curvature of the spine without a known cause, and 10% have curvature that progresses with age. This can cause back pain, body image dissatisfaction, and cardiovascular dysfunction. Rigid bracing is prescribed to prevent uh, curve progression at a rate of about 30,000 30, adolescents per year. However, 25% of patients have spinal curvature that progresses uh, in spite of bracing, which suggests that the screening tools for identifying bracing candidates is inadequate, are inadequate. And uh, typical strategies for screening bracing candidates and predicting curve progression focus on predicting growth velocity, typically by evaluating the growth plates of the hand or hip. In the, uh, this specific uh, framework, the Sanders framework for determining growth velocity, the hand and wrist are imaged uh, to identify closure of the multiple growth plates here. And then this information is extrapolated to predict spinal growth. So you can see in the inside on the left that growth plates are open here, which indicates a skeletally immature individual. There was a lot of growing to do in their hand and then assumedly in their spine as well. Versus the inset on the right where the individual has fully closed growth plates and has less growing to do. So at best, while this is a great way to uh, visualize the hands, 
uh, it's, it's only an indirect measurement of spinal growth. And uh, while it's not clear what causes scoliosis, it's clear that abnormal mechanics are a factor in the progression of degenerative changes. So on this MRI image on the left, you can see uh, the bright white nucleus signal in the con convex region of the curve, but no signal in the concave region of the curve. Uh, and this suggests that disc health is related to curvature and likely loading. Similarly, in the histological images on the right, you can see that the cartilage of the facet joints, which are bilateral joints that stabilize the spine at each level, um, you can see that this cartilage is affected by curvature as well, where the orange stain indicates proteoglycans, um, or lack thereof, suggesting that loading also affects the facet cartilage. So my global hypothesis for this work is that uh, direct measures of spine mechanics are predictive of disc atrophy and curve progression. And uh, as a postdoc, I've developed methods uh, for measuring in vivo spine me biomechanics. So uh, to do so, uh, we developed an MRI framework to measure disc geometry and three dimensions, and then ultimately the uh, change in geometry due to an applied load. And we do this non-invasively using an MRI sequence called FLASH. This process requires segmenting the discs in the sagittal and coronal planes, and then compiling these sets of contours into a 3D disc volume, which can be further divided into regions to measure site-specific changes in disc height. In this study, we use the natural diurnal loading that occurs over the course of the day to measure disc deformations that are caused by daily activity. And uh, we know from previous work that from AM to PM, gravitational loading and physical activity cause water to be forced from the disc and then the disc height to ultimately decrease. And, um, and so, and just an aside, uh, this study and all the human studies that I'll present um, have been performed on uh, 18 to 30 year old asymptomatic individuals that were an even distribution of uh, male and female. So here I have laid out the results um, at each spinal level and uh, the regional changes in disc height at each level. We found that disc compression was concentrated posteriorly in the lowest lumbar levels. Um, and this is where I have the uh, max arrows pointed to. And this was particularly interesting as these are also the same levels, uh, all the, the same spinal levels and disc regions where disc herniations typically occur. And uh, here are some results from an intraoperative study of the prevalence of disc herniation uh, by spinal level to support that. Um, so because of this, we looked to see if the imbalance between anterior po and posterior strains also changed by level, uh, which in fact they did. And then to determine, uh, to determine why this was the case, we uh, thought that perhaps spinal curvature could play a role. And we found that the wedge angle, which I have labeled here to the left in red, uh, also increases caudally with a significant correlation between the wedge angle and the magnitude of this strain imbalance, suggesting that spinal curvature, even in the case of these relatively healthy individuals, drives the deformation patterns. Um, I briefly mentioned the facet joints and their relationship to scoliosis. The facet joints are two uh, bilateral joints on the posterior aspect of the spine, and these include capsules, articular cartilage, and meniscus-like structures, similar to other synovial joints. We're interested in biomechanics of the facet joints because we think that these joints work together um, with the disc as a three-joint complex at each level, where loads are balanced between the three joints when the spine is in neutral alignment, and then when in flexion, the anterior discs are preferentially loaded while the posterior facets are offloaded, and then the, reserve, the reverse in uh, extension, where the posterior facets are preferentially loaded and the anterior discs are offloaded. We also developed a method to measure the change in facet geometry due to an applied load. So we again segment the facets in sagittal, axial, and coronal planes to develop 3D models of the joint space and then measure the mean joint width. And again, in this study, we used the natural diurnal loading that occurs over the course of the day. And we measured the change in facet joint width, and in this case, related it to the degeneration grade of the uh, disc at the adjacent level. So uh, here, the results, the blue bars are measurements of facets at levels with healthy discs, and the white bars are uh, facets at, uh, adjacent to degenerated discs. We found that facets at levels with degenerate, degenerated discs were significantly thicker and compressed significantly less over the course of the day, suggesting a relationship between disc degeneration and facet function. We're also developing a method to further dissect the differences between healthy and diseased spines. Um, in this case, we use a high-speed biplanar radiography system that's capable of tracking 3D joint kinematics um, at 120 frames per second uh, with a field of view about the size of a beach ball. Here's an example of a cadaver spine imaged on each plane. 
We use an automatic registration software to match the MRI models through the biplanar radiographs. To do so, the uh, MRI model of verte the vertebrae is uh, uh, man manipulated in a virtual model of the lab, and its vertices are projected onto each radiograph. Then edges on the X-ray are identified, and an optimization algorithm minimizes the distance between these projected points and the detected edge points. With this system, we were able to track vertebral uh, position with uh, uh, a precision of 180 microns and 0 0.8 degrees. So, um, so I've shown you that we've developed tools for measuring in vivo disc and facet deformation, and we identified a relationship between spinal loading and spinal curvature. Uh, for scoliosis, I hypothesized that in vivo biomechanics are predictive of curve progression. So we're currently evaluating scoliosis patients to determine if biomechanics are measured, uh, as measured by in vivo imaging, um, are predictive of curve progression after bracing. The second research area that I've pursued as a postdoc is in evaluating the relationship between mechanics and biology in the context of using exercise as a regenerative therapy for disc disease. So it's been well established that physical loading is necessary for maintaining soft tissue health. Here's an example um, in which chondrocyte seeded hydrogels are stimulated in a compressive loading bioreactor. This increases proteoglycan content, as you can see here, with an alcyon blue stain. And consequently, there's a large increase in mechanical properties. Uh, these results are directly and translated in vivo on the disk. There are a number of manuscripts uh, describing dynamic loading devices applied to the rat tail. In this particular, uh, in this particular example, um, loading caused an increase in disk proteoglycan content, uh, which is also used as a metric for improved disk health. And I'm particularly interested in exercise because exercise is a natural way to induce loading in your spine and could be a method to stimulate disc regeneration. So there have been successful regeneration attempts in rats where rat discs that have been chemically degenerated um, are then recovered with treadmill exercise. And there's also evidence for the translational potential of exercise as compared to sedentary controls, high volume runners and cyclists have increased disc Q2 relaxation time, uh, which is an MRI, an MRI biomarker of disc health. It may be that loading induced transport, it may be that the loading induced uh, transport um, of small molecules like glucose and oxygen is the mechanism by which exercise uh, stimulates disc health. So in this paper, our moderator, Sarah, as a grad student in Eric Ledet's group who just presented, inserted pins into the lumbar vertebrae of rats and they measured the concentration of a small molecule MRI contrast agent in the disc with or without dynamic loading. They showed that low rate loading increased the concentration of this small molecule. And this has implications for other small molecules like glucose and oxygen that the disc cells need for uh, their survival. So then my hypothesis for this work is that exercise induced loading modulates disc transport and, it improve, and can improve disc health. So to measure how exercise loads the spine, uh, we adapted our MRI method to measure disc deformations caused by walking. We measured a mean disc compression of about 2% after 30 or 90 minutes of walking and maximum regional deformations of up to 5%. So these data established uh, the baseline healthy range of exercise induced loading in these subjects. Uh, to quantify transport of the disc, we developed a method to measure changes in disc fluid using MRI. We measure the T2 relaxation time, which um, as Grace mentioned earlier, is a, a quantitative MRI bar biomarker that strongly correlates to disc water content. This method involves segmenting um, each MRI slice on the T2 maps and then uh, compiling these in 3D to measure the mean uh, T2 relaxation time across the disc. We similarly use the natural diurnal loading to measure diurnal fluid transport. We first measured the total fluid content in each disc. Uh, this was greatest at the cranial disc starting at T12L1 and least in the caudal disc ending at L5S1. Then we also measured the diurnal change in disc T2 and found that this decreased by level as well and in the same pattern, suggesting that there could be a level dependent difference in fluid transport. Interestingly, the diurnal change in disc fluid is inverse to the pattern of degeneration that's typically experienced. Here's some data on the, um, on the prevalence of degeneration by spinal level to support that. So this may indicate that the diurnal change in T2 is a biomarker of disc health. And then to complement our measures of fluid transport, we look to develop a measure of nutrient transport. So positron emission tomography or PET imaging is one way to measure in vivo glucose uptake. Uh, with PET, 18 fluorine is covalently bound to a glucose analog, which is taken up by the cell. Um, it then enters the glycolysis cycle 
Um, it remains in the cytosol to radioactively decay and emit a positron. And then the location of this event can be detected and reconstructed in 3D. So this is uh, typically used clinically to identify tumors, which have uh, a much faster me metabolic rate and take up glucose much faster than surrounding tissues. To determine the feasibility of using PET to measure disc glucose uptake, we scanned rats at young, adult, and old ages by uh, PET-CT and measured how glucose uptake varied with age. So here's an example of a typical PET-CT scan on the left where the areas of increased signal intensity um, represent increased glucose uptake. And then the colored regions represent ROIs drawn on each disc to measure disc-specific glucose uptake. Using the CT images from these scans, we found that disc volume decreased significantly from the adult to old age group, confirming that these rat discs degenerate with age. And then we also found that disc glucose uptake decreased with age, um, and that the decrease occurred between the young and the adult age group, uh, preceding the change in disc volume. So this suggests that the age-related differences in glucose uptake occurred in the young group before changes in disc uh, volume were apparent. So further, if diminished glucose uptake precedes disc degeneration, it could therefore be a biomarker of disc health. So we demonstrated here that uh, disc fluid transport and glucose uptake may be predictors of future disc disease. So I hypothesized that modulating transport can limit disease progression and stimulate regeneration. So what I'm working on now is to use various exercise protocols, including uh, walking, jogging, and running, to determine that the relationships between exercise-induced loading, uh, fluid transport, and uh, disc metabolism, and then to leverage those relationships to optimize exercise protocols for improved disc health. And then, uh, so the final part of my talk, so uh, recently I've been interested in combining these imaging tools with patient information to predict spine disease. Uh, to do so, I've taken a bioinformatics approach to evaluating large musculoskeletal data sets. And here I'll highlight one example for predicting spine health. Um, so as, uh, as we know, there are multiple factors for developing spine disease, including previous trauma, genetics, psychosocial factors like anxiety and depression, smoking, obesity, diabetes, occupational factors, and posture. And I propose that there are additional mechanical transport metabolic factors that cause spine disease as well. Um, so my global hypothesis for this part of my work is that uh, patient factors like those listed above, in addition to physical measurements like mechanics and transport, are required to predict spine disease and back pain. Towards developing the computational tools necessary for analyzing a large data set, I look to, towards uh, what has been done in evaluating osteoarthritis. So the OAI, or Osteoarthritis Initiative Database, is a uh, multi-center longitudinal cohort study of uh, NEOA, which spans 11 years. At uh, four recruitment sites, they've, en they've enrolled 4,800 patients and have information on their demographics, medical history, uh, physical examination, diet, and lifestyle. Um, while this is a knee focused database, they also have uh, some information on their spine health. So I leveraged this database to evaluate back pain. So of the 4,800 volunteers who enrolled in the study, we identified 225 that said they had back pain for two weeks out of the previous uh, month. And of the over 1,000 variables describing these individuals, we identified 443 variables relevant to the spine. And then um, we borrowed some bioinformatics techniques from um, single cell analysis. So we perform patient clustering using a, a technique called K-metoids, which groups similar individuals in an unsupervised manner. Uh, in parallel, we perform dimension reduction using a technique called UMAP, which you may be familiar with um, if you have experience um, analyzing single cell RNA data. UMAP reduces the dimensionality from 443 to two to allow visualization in 2D, similar to what you would use principal components for. In doing this, we identified three distinct clusters. Um, so uh, in this plot, each data point represents an individual and the distance between points represents the relative difference between individuals. So we systematically determine who makes up these patient clusters. Uh, we first confirmed that spine OA and back pain were similar among the clusters. And we then identified 125 variables that significantly differentiated the clusters. These were primarily in the following categories, age, joint health, physical fitness, diet, and socioeconomic status. Individuals from the second cluster appeared to have better joint health in their lower extremities. You can see here in these box plots that uh, individuals in cluster two um, have little to no knee pain. 
despite having back pain. And you can see how well this variable maps onto the UMAP projection where the white data points indicate no knee pain and then the blue data points indicate many days of knee pain. They also were in overall better physical health. So here's the physical summary score from the uh, standard FCS 12 questionnaire, which was uh, significantly increased in cluster two and displays nicely on the UMAP graphs. But they were on average much older. So as you can see here in the box plots and the UMAP representation, um, um, yeah, and they, they also had, in addition to being older, they also had characteristics associated with higher socioeconomic status, including that they were better educated and had greater income. In addition, they were better insured and were predominantly Caucasian compared to the other clusters that were racially mixed. Now, uh, cluster one and three tell a little bit different story, one related to diet. Individuals in cluster three had a higher caloric intake, um, as you can see at the top of the slide in both the box plots and the UMAP projection. Um, and then they also had higher fat intake, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Where cluster three consumed the most food, cluster one consumed the least, particularly when it came to healthy foods. Uh, take these two examples of spinach and carrots. Um, they also consume, consume less vitamins through supplements and less um, vitamins in their diet with uh, vitamin C here as an example. So in this study, we found that back pain was related to a number of factors, including patient diet, lifestyle, and uh, socioeconomic factors, uh, which is particularly interesting given the uh, racial disparities that have been made apparent in the American healthcare system. Uh, so we believe that these are further uh, worthy of further study. In terms of spine pain, uh, in certain terms of spine disease, um, missing from this OA, OA, OA database uh, was detailed information about spine health and spine imaging features. So I hypothesize that a spine-focused database with detailed imaging, back pain, medical, and lifestyle data can reveal additional patient phenotypes that can be targeted uh, with specific back pain interventions for personalized medicine. And this is a study design uh, being made popular in the NIH backpack program. Uh, in the future, early predictors of disc disease like fluid transport and glucose uptake, uh, in addition to biomechanics, composition, and patient factors, would benefit a, a longitudinal study for tracking spine health. So uh, that concludes my talk. If I could leave you just a couple take home messages. First, the uh, limitations in clinical imaging and our understanding of pathogenesis, including the relationship between mechanics and biology, impede diagnosing back pain. And second, that new imaging tools that connect spine mechanics, biology, and health can improve the diagnosis of back pain. So thank you so much for your attention. And uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators from my postdoctoral work and grad school work and my uh, uh, postdoc was funded by the NIH. Thank you. Thanks, John, uh, for a really great talk. Um, I think in the interest of time, we're, we're unfortunately out of time for today, um, but please feel free to, to follow up with John directly if you have questions um, for him. So I'd, I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers today uh, once more and thank all of our attendees for joining us.